green tech is a very, very broad, you know, anything can be green these days. A light bulb that's, that's, that's less, you know, that's more energy efficient is green. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it, it cuts across so many sectors, whether it's agriculture, building, all sorts of things. So what, what we said is let's have a more targeted approach rather than trying to be everything to everyone. So we looked at initially wind and solar, and then green hydrogen suddenly popped up into all of our lives. So we've included a little bit of that into it. Also largely because to produce green hydrogen, you need a lot of solar and wind energy to produce it. So it fits in very nicely with what we're doing in this space as well. Um, wind and solar already becoming well-established across the region, green hydrogen more emergent. Um, opportunity, small number of countries. Some of the projects that they're talking about in the green hydrogen space probably aren't actually feasible. Um, if you look at one or two of them that have, that have been mentioned in the press, not in our region, but further north, um, and projects that are sort of three or four times the GDP of the host country are going to be very, very difficult to finance, if nothing else. So we, we'll, we'll see how that goes along. Um, but, you know, the landscape, I think, has evolved significantly. We, we, we started off at the beginning of the last decade with a handful of projects and sort of uh, a lot of controversy over whether these things were, were ever going to work or not. Um, but as the IPP program has and, and, and offtakes um, from central utilities, not just in South Africa, but across the region, and I think we're seeing more and more of this, is that there is a, a, a much greater move towards um, utility scale solar and wind. And then also just at a general level, um, solar panels. I mean, you could go to just about any shopping center these days and they've converted the parking lot into a, into a solar farm. So it's, it's becoming a much more prevalent part of our lives at, at almost every level. And I'm not even going to go into to sort of household rooftop. Mining and industrial sectors. And again, um, we see quite often in the press and we, we read about it, we encounter it, that the South African mining industry could probably put between three and 4,000 megawatts into the system right now of renewable energy if they were able to get over the, over the, 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 the line uh, in terms of regulatory and, and transmission lines and so on and so forth. But it's not just here. Um, first quantum mines in, Moza, in, in Zambia, uh, the largest copper producer there, is putting in about 430 megawatts of combined solar, wind, and battery storage. So, you know, we, we're talking about utility scale just on one mining site in, in Zambia. And there are plenty more of those across the region. So we're going to see more and more of this. Um, other sectors are following. IPP development is evolving away from more restrictive models to more flexible ones across the region. And I'd, and I'd like to encourage South African suppliers to start looking at the region. And we're going to go through some of the opportunities because in, in other markets, um, IPPs and renewables have been in play for quite a lot longer in some instances than they have here. Certainly independent power producers in countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, and so on have been operating for many, many years and quite successfully as well. Um, so unpacking the opportunity, you'll see there um, and there, if I can get that right, uh, that in the initial database that we put together, and I say the initial one because that was up until the end of, of March this year, um, solar and wind projects across sub-Saharan Africa. There was 104 wind projects and over a thousand solar projects from five megawatts and upwards. So we weren't looking at those below. Otherwise, we would never have got to complete the study. There's just too many of them. Um, and if you look at, for instance, um, I, I, I think it was UBA Bank in Nigeria. Um, they've almost all of their outlets now are run by solar power. Um, if you agglomerate all that together, these little itty bits, it comes up to about 16 megawatts that they're putting in to their own operations in, um, in Nigeria. Uh, mini grid opportunities in Nigeria is a $20 billion opportunity over the next five years. So just in one country, Nigeria obviously uh, is, a, is a, a massive opportunity in Africa and, and has its own heartbeat. So what we've looked at there is, is projects, as you can see, um, some of them have been obviously completed because once a project is built or once an infrastructure is built, it still needs to operate and be maintained and have parts and components supplied into it as you go along. They also need at the end of life cycle to somehow be managed as well. And I think that there's a real opportunity in that. Um, and then obviously 
pipeline projects from feasibility to construction, uh, conceptual projects. Some of those are in there, particularly around renewable energy programs within countries. Um, there are very few countries on the continent today that don't have some kind of a renewable energy component to their energy planning going forward, whether it's utility scale or whether it is mini grids, in, particularly in rural areas um, and off-grid solutions. So there's, there, there's a huge amount to, to tap into and unpack in that space. Um, some of those programs obviously include hydro and biomass, which isn't in the scope, but they will have some wind and solar in them. Uh, and I think you'll see that as, as, you, as, as we start to unpack the, the opportunity in the region. So total value of the projects is stated at around about $35 billion, um, but it's obviously a lot more than that, simply because a lot of the projects that have been announced in the last 18 months or so don't yet have a defined value. You can, you can thumb suck the values, maybe it comes up to about $60, $70 billion overall. If you include green hydrogen, you can just pick a number, any number you like, um, because nobody's going to tell you you're wrong, simply because none of these projects have actually started yet. But you would look at in, in excess of $1,500 billion over the next, uh, sorry, that should be $150 billion over the next five to seven years. Um, but as I've said, it should be tempered by the fact that a lot of those are, are in a, a conceptual stage um, at the moment. So if you look at somewhere like Mauritania, and I'm not picking on the Mauritanians, um, but they've got two massive green hydrogen projects, um, sort of 40 gigawatts of green hydrogen, but the cost associated with that is about four to five times the GDP of the country. So how, how do you, 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 you get past that? Um, if we look at wind power, you'll see that at the moment, South Africa still accounts for about 50% of the installed and upcoming wind power in the region. But it's not the only country. So, And I think this is really where the opportunity comes in, is if you are a supplier, whether you're located within an SEZ or whether you're located outside an SEZ, there is a real opportunity to start looking at some of the other countries in the region. Kenya, um, obviously with the Lake Tucano wind project at 300-odd megawatts is a major one. Tanzania, Ethiopia, Ghana, Namibia, you can see... Um, where those countries are around there. Um, Mozambique, yesterday's paper in Condesi announcing another 300 megawatts of, of solar and wind that they're looking to develop in Mozambique. So it just every day we see more and more projects coming into the system. I'm probably picking up four or five significant projects a day um, in both in South Africa and the rest of the region. Um, and so um, once Chaboni and I sit down and we start looking at an update of this. Um, these numbers will grow significantly as well. Um, so if you look at what the, where we are, suppliers based in South Africa enjoy tariff-free access through the, 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 the SACU and SADC trade protocols to another 18% of the projects in the region. So almost 70% of the projects in the region are based within our geographic and, and trade preference area. Um, and I think it is significant because it's not just about only tariffs. You know, I, I don't want us to get too hung up on only the tariffs, but it's also um, the fact that we are physically close to those countries. We have very good trade links with most of the countries in the region. Um, for those of you who are not aware, the largest export destination for manufactured products from South Africa globally is into the SADC region. Um, so as a, as a trading block, South Africa exported about 340 billion rands worth of goods last year into the SADC region. Of that, 90% was value added. In other words, value added manufacturing in South Africa has a real home in our region, in the SADC region. And I think it's really important to understand that as this sector grows, not just in South Africa, but through the rest of the region as well. Um, uh, so, yeah, and as I've said there, most of those are accessible um, by, from South Africa by road or rail, as, as well as sea to, to the Indian Ocean Islands and, and Tanzania. You can, you can do road to Tanzania if you like, um, depending on the season and how much rain they've had in the border regions between Zambia and Tanzania. So I think it's, it is nice that we also see uh, in, in some of the, the, the western side of the, the continent as well, which is nicely accessible from the Western Cape, that there is uh, an opportunity there as well. If we look at this, and um, I've based this on, on some of the data that the manufacturing circle 
uh, has done that. The Manufacturing Circle did a fantastic study on what do you put into these things? You know, I mean, we all talk about wind power and solar power and whatever. What actually goes into it? So I think if you, if you look at, at, at unpacking that opportunity and you look at the materials by country, obviously South Africa at this stage is still by far the largest because we have the most projects in the region um, and we have the most developed sector. Um, but we also see other countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, um, in East Africa. And East Africa is becoming a, a, an energy hub um, across many, many different energy um, types and um, is fairly easily accessible from here. But you look at those different things in terms of, from a wind power, the, 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 the flat steel used in tower and other steel, the, the, the cast iron, the, the glass, carbon composites, copper. I'm not going to go through all of those. You can, you can see those. You'll get a copy of this presentation anyway um, by country, and you can see where all the key ones are at this stage. Um, and then in terms of looking forward, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to assess um, going forward because a lot of the projects obviously don't have final dates and values. Um, but the annual requirement in terms of wind would be around 200,000 tons uh, at the moment of inputs for the foreseeable future. Um, and most of those are already readily available in South Africa at one level or another. So in terms of those basic materials, we're not talking about obviously some of the components and so on that go into it. But if you look at that and you can see how things just start to, to increase um, over time. The one thing that, that, that I think, and perhaps this will come out in the panel discussion, is that there, it, it's not an, an entirely even increase, and that is mainly because of the nature of South African procurement around the different um, reaps that we've had. So you'll have a spike when we have a new round, a new bid round and an implementation, and then a slight drop-off. Um, but I think if you look, the exciting one is the not declared, um, where you can add a lot of that into the next three to four years. Um, and then we believe that you'll see a, a, a further increase going forward from there. Um, solar power, obviously, solar power is, is a lot easier to deploy in many respects. Um, and, and as I say, we've only really looked at um, solar power from a, a sort of utility. I think in, in South Africa, we have a slightly different threshold for utility than in other countries. Um, so anything from about five megawatts and upwards. Uh, and you can see there also very nice spread across uh, sub-Saharan Africa in terms of what's available. South Africa still by far the largest um, market in the region. So we do have that base load. And I think it's important to understand that, that if you're looking at that base load of projects, um, roughly 9,500 um, solar projects in operation under construction or declared. So in other words, those that haven't yet. And that doesn't include REAP6. Um, so we, 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 we're, we're going to be adding in that as it starts to unfold. Um, but you can also see that there's a very strong Southern African component. Zimbabwe, Angola, Namibia um, are all, all key players in that. Um, I, I think those of you who, who spend time in Angola, um, probably a lot of people spend time largely in Luanda. But if you go down to the south of Angola, obviously um, the Namib Desert flows across the borders between Namibia um, and Angola, and there is massive, massive potential um, that is starting to be unlocked in the southern part of Angola as well. But, but once again, you can see a very nice spread of, of countries that have um, solar projects under consideration or construction. Um, again, some of the East African markets that have, are easily accessible from South Africa via our ports um, are in there as well. So I think just looking at that, and you start to see some of the numbers that are coming out of it, these numbers will be updated in the next couple of months, and I'm sure we'll add um, a su significant um, number of megawatts to the, 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 the declared values that we have. Um, again, unpacking that opportunity in terms of materials, um, and you can see there a lot of the projects obviously don't have a completion date as yet, so we can't really forecast that too easily in terms of when they're going to happen. But, um, you know, it, it usually is an 18-month to two-year process. So you can probably, people that are cleverer than I am, can figure that out and, and do it for themselves. But volumes of materials are starting to rise. Um, and you can see, obviously, from 2014 through, it was a fairly unbalanced demand. And again, 
um, looking at far higher in the reap delivery years, if you like, um, averaging around about 87,000 tons. Um, but in, in the next couple of years, we're, starting, we're going to see that rise in quite sharply um, towards 2024, maybe 150,000 tons, probably a lot more if you include smaller projects, which we obviously don't have in this because there's simply too many of them. Um, and uh, 250 projects that are, that are in the pipeline or under construction, Southern Africa accounts for about 80% of the total requirement. And that's largely accessible from South Africa. So once again, we are looking at not just South African demand, we're looking at what we can supply into the rest of the region. And that is really why we are looking at this entire process and saying South Africa, with a base load of projects, it makes sense to supply into the rest of the region. And it's not just the widgets. It's not just the components. We have the, 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 the services that go into it, the EPC countries, EPC companies, the EPCMs. We have law firms. We have um, logistics companies that actually specialize in doing this kind of thing. So we have that whole suite of services that are available. Training. We have institutions like Green Cape, like the Atlantis SEZ, like the Export Council. So we have this institutional capacity in South Africa that I think should be utilized to expand into the rest of the region. Um, and I think that that really is what we're trying to achieve through TFSA is to, to, it is to say, let's, let's now start building this capacity and let's start looking at opportunities um, beyond South Africa's borders. I know many South African companies, because most of the, 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 the press around the rest of the continent is quite negative, um, I've spent 25 years traveling around the rest of Africa and I, I can promise you it's not as scary as a lot of people think. Um, and if you have the correct partners, the correct business models um, to, to, to unpack your, your exports into the rest of the region, it can be very lucrative as well. So just looking at some of those numbers, um, and I, I took this from a European Union study, just in terms of the number of panels. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's a very blunt instrument that I'm using here to, to say, how, you know, what is the opportunity? But looked at another way, the sector will require, in terms of these utility scale projects, um, around about, we're, we're, we're looking at, in reap delivery years, sort of 1.8, 1.9 million panels a year. Uh, and through to 2024, 2.4 million panels. Um, if you look at the green hydrogen project in Namibia, which has been signed off, it's a $9.4 billion project, which will be phased in over the next six years or so. Um, you, you, you can add, you know, probably four, five, six, seven million panels into those projects as they start to unlock. If you talk to the Northern Cape government around there, um, the, the whole Buhubai development, which includes a railway port and Sasol as the anchor green hydrogen developer, they're also talking similar numbers over the next six to seven years. So we, we could really see these, these numbers here start to, to increase quite substantially over the next few years as we go ahead. Um, and, I, and I think that that really is quite an exciting prospect for the, the region um, and, and to have a look at this Slide on green hydrogen, you can see there I talked about Mauritania, a couple of projects that, that have been announced, um, estimated $9,800 billion should they all go ahead. Um, and uh, obviously, I, I think one of the things to look at in terms of green hydrogen is just follow the German chancellor around. Um, as we know, the war in Ukraine has, has um, not only devastated the Ukraine, but, but has completely disrupted supplies of um, gas and potentially could disrupt them even further going forward. Uh, and so companies and governments in Europe are scrambling for new supply, not just of LNG, which is obviously an immediate need, um, and the, the switching on of coal-fired power stations and so on, but green hydrogen. And it's, it's no um, coincidence that the new German chancellor in the last few years has visited Mauritania, South Africa, Namibia, Senegal, Niger. And those are countries that have a stated green hydrogen um, program. We can add Djibouti into that this week, where they are now undertaking feasibility studies on green hydrogen in Djibouti. 
assuming there's enough space for them with all those military bases that they've got there. But that, that really is where we're starting to see this unpack. Green hydrogen from, from the DR Congo is um, largely around hydropower, but the rest of them will be wind and solar. So you can see what the, the kind of um, potential there is to develop this. And assuming that those offtake agreements, we understand that the, the offtake agreement for the Northern Cape project has been signed with the port of Rotterdam as the, the um, incoming port for green hydrogen from the Northern Cape and with buyers in Europe, uh, specifically in Germany, to take that green hydrogen. So um, those kinds of, of developments could have an, an incredibly catalytic impact on the delivery of solar and wind technology and, and projects into the region um, as, as we see that going forward. So there would also be things like the announcement Anglo-American pioneering the delivery of, 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 of hydrogen-based um, mining fleets and will now be taking that technology globally instead of just into South Africa. We have obviously hydrogen valleys in South Africa. So the, 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 the development and the the um, outflow of the potential of green hydrogen from a South African base with South African technology into the broader region and then even globally, I think is a really exciting development that we've got at the moment. So just looking forward, the, the desk research um, was completed at the end of March. Uh, so as I say, this um, presentation that you're seeing, which we did in, in April, uh, is already a few months out of date. Uh, and as I said, I'm picking up projects on a daily basis in South Africa and the rest of the region. Um, but what it, what it includes is the, the name, the country, the type of project, the value, the stage, the project owner, developer, OEM technology supplier. Um, and that is what we are presenting to you today and what you'll get, what, what is available going forward. What we've also included in it is sort of a yes, no. So on each country, and each project, if you look at that database, you'll see it says there, um, member of SACU, yes, no, SADC, yes, no, um, African Continental Free Trade Area, yes, no, obviously most of those are yes, although that is still, um, you know, that's still an ongoing thing that hasn't really come to an end as yet. And so we are looking at, you know, as countries sign on to that. And I think if you look at from a South African perspective, we have duty-free access into the southern cone of Africa. But some of those countries in West Africa, like Ghana, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Mauritania, as they come into the, the continental free trade area, it could potentially unlock much better access for us, and particularly into East Africa. If, if I had a dollar for every time I got screamed at by a South African company because they don't get duty-free access into Kenya, I would have been retired a long time ago. I'm not a I'm not a member of the government, so it's not my fault that we don't have duty-free access to the Kenyan market. But with this continental free trade area, as it unlocks the East African community, which has a number of the most dynamic countries in the continent, in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and then from those angles um, into places like um, into the Eastern DRC and South Sudan, as well as into Ethiopia, you start to see a much more compelling argument developing uh, as South African companies looking into those areas. So I think that that's really is where we are. Um, the, the, uh, as, as Josh said earlier, um, the reports will be available to companies through the BSOs. Um, those initially were the, the three that you see there, Green Cape, Atlantis, and SAEC, um, possibly others as well. I mean, I, I think that the the... the, the Reports will be quite widely distributed. And then as the, the, the updates go forward, um, there will be quarterly updates produced by the SAEEC um, on the, the market reports that will be available to, to people who want to access them um, for the purposes of utilizing South Africa as a base. 